going to be in Luke chapter 22. We'll give people a couple minutes to join up and see that we're live and to get, get in here. Let me know if you can see me and hear me. All that jazz. I thought the classics. Nothing wrong with the classics. <laughs> Uh, we're starting to see some people trickle in now. Hey there, B. Disney, Amanda. And there's Hannah Beth. Good to see ya. Well, you on your grandma's account? Well, there you go. New subscriber. <laughs> hey there, Marie. Glad to see ya. Hey Donna, positive blessings Carrie, Sue Maria, Barbara, glad you could make it. Welcome to Bible study. We finally finished off with the Luke 21. If you're just joining us and you're interested in all the apocalyptic stuff, you can go back and uh, do the beginning of Luke 21 or better yet, look in the description of this video for uh, my Matthew 24 video about the end of the world and the preterism stuff. Hey there, Veronica, Kathy, Kim. Good to see you guys. It has been a pretty good day today. Hi, Corinda. Still have your cough? I, mine's still lingering on a, a tiny little bit, too. I do feel better. I'm, I'm pretty much better. I just got a lingering cough. Oh, been a pretty good day. We just finished our, it's the last Tuesday of the month, Tuesday's game night at our house, and the last Tuesday is video game game night, so we call it Last Lance Tuesday, and so we played mini golf, which is one of the favorites at our house, and so we played that Asher and Claudia tied, mostly because Asher helped Claudia <laughs> with her turn, so, oh, thank you, Hannah. Hi, Sherry, good to see ya. Amanda, good to see you. All right, we can probably... Oh, I didn't get it queued up here. We can probably start following along, and people can join while we're reading the chapter. It's going to be in Luke chapter 22. Almost done with Luke. We're going to figure out what to do next. Three more weeks. Here we go. Luke 22. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, called the Passover, was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. 
but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, But now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then, seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, 
Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Only verses. The men who were guarding Jesus began <clears throat> mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy! Who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and teachers of the law, met together. And Jesus was led before them. If you're the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You are right in saying, I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. All right, that's a lot of chapters. 71 verses. A lot of verses. Uh, more people joined while we were there. Uh, in their grace, I'm using, uh, I'm just using this internet right now to just play this. Uh, but I have different apps that I'm using. I list them both in the description here. Hey there, Kelsey and Everyday Blue. Oh, yeah, Hope and Hilda. Glad to see you guys. So, um, lots here. This is a story that if you've uh, been in the church at all, you probably know the story of Jesus being crucified. There's a lot of detail in here. And again, Luke is somebody who was not an eyewitness to these events. So he researched them out. So he asked people and did more like a, a reporter. Well, hey there, Adrian. Glad to see you. Glad you see you still showed up. <laughs> With crazy Tom here. <laughs> oh, I'm just playing. Uh, but yeah, so uh, you, Luke is a lot more specific. Um, it's got a lot of details that are missed from the other Gospels. Um, with some of the ones that are there and some interesting twists on things. So we'll kind of go through it as we talk about it. We're not going to get too far here. <laughs> Either there, Kathleen. Let's see here. Um, seriously, I am glad that you guys are all here with us. I, I was a little worried after doing the, the Luke 21 stuff that I'd, I'd turn people away, but I'm, I'm glad that I didn't. Some people can... Uh, Try not hard not to offend anybody, but sometimes I might because I can sound a little arrogant sometimes, and I don't mean that. So, anyways, so feast of unleavened bread is the Passover, and so uh, in other places they call it feast of unleavened bread because if you recall, they didn't have time to add the yeast. And you might be asking yourself, why did they not have time to add yeast? It's just like bloop, pretty easy. Uh, but that's not how they did yeast in those days. Uh, you can actually, your dough will kind of ferment on its own. And so they'll make dough and let it sit there and cover it up, kind of like a sourdough, and let it, you know, ferment on its own. Um, and, of course, it takes, it takes a long time to do that. And so they didn't have time to do that, so they just took it without them and didn't have yeast in it. So that's more probably what was going on, most likely. Um, but anyway, so this is the Passover. And this is, of course, relevant because... Remember when the Passover was when um, the Jews left uh, Egypt in the Old Testament and Moses leads them out. There's the, the, the 12 plagues and all that. And, and then Pharaoh comes out. Um, if you recall, I made the allusion before uh, that Matthew records Jesus being called out of Egypt. Remember when Jesus was a baby and they, Herod ordered all the babies two and younger would be killed? Um, during that time... Joseph and Mary were told to hide in Egypt. And so they went and hid in Egypt until Herod died. And when Herod died, the angel says, you can get out of Egypt now. And then it says, and so was fulfilled what was spoken of through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son, which is a quote in Hosea 11. And, uh, and if you go back and read Hosea 11, it's actually talking about when Israel was led out of Egypt. And so my, what I'm leading up to here is... Um, 
Jesus was, Jesus is the Passover lamb. You may have heard that before um, during during the uh, the Passover event in in uh, Egypt. They put the lamb's blood over the door and they sacrificed the lamb, or they ate the lamb. Really, they didn't sacrifice the lamb. They ate the lamb. They killed the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, and they ate it because they were going to be leaving the next day. And um, when the angel of death saw the blood of the lamb, uh, he passed over their house. That's why they call it Passover, because it passed over their house. And so, anyways, those people were spared. And, of course, that is definitely a type and a shadow of what Jesus was going to do here. That Jesus is the Lamb of God, and his blood covering us um, causes the angel, the spirit, the angel of death to pass over us, and we don't have to have a, a life that we die uh, for eternity, but we can live for eternity, which is just awesome. Hey there, Jen. Glad you can make it. So anyways, I know that's a lot for just first one, but, uh, well, that's, it's, I'm in a good mood, I guess. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. So you see this over and over again. They were asking Jesus a bunch of questions. Jesus always made them look stupid. They tried to catch him. He always escaped. Anytime they tried to get him, uh, he, Jesus always got away or he turned the crowd against them. And so they were really scared to do anything in front of the crowd so they would get in, get in trouble, get stoned. Um, and so they were looking for a way to get rid of him. Uh, then we have this verse, Satan entered Judas, called this chariot one of the twelve. So Satan goes into Judas. And this is, that's always a curious statement as to exactly how that happened or why that happened or the, the point. Um, but it happened. And then Judas goes to the chief priest and offers the temple guard to discuss how they might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. Judas, we already know Judas was greedy. So he already wanted to profit from Jesus' death. Um, I think, I honestly think Judas kind of gets a bad rap here, not because he wasn't a bad guy, but because um, I think Judas just wanted to profit off of Jesus' invincibility. I mean, there's so many times that Jesus is going to push right to the brow of a hill when he's totally cornered, going to throw him off the hill, and he just walks, it says he walks through the crowd. Now, how does that happen when they're trying to kill you? I mean, I'm sure, I don't know if it was a parting of the Red Sea type situation, or he just you know, kind of phased in between them all or walked through their bodies literally or what happened, but he always escaped. Whenever they looked for him, he always escaped. They never caught him. Even though when they told him, don't go back to, to Jerusalem, they tried to kill you. And of course, you know, he always gets away. And so anyways, my thought process is, is that Judas is like, man, we should be making money off this guy. He's so hard to catch. No one can ever get him. And, uh, and so, um, Judas goes and says, hey, what do you give me? I'll turn him over to you, because assuming he would get away. And you can see this because I believe it's in the Gospel of John. Uh, Judas is going along betraying Jesus. He's got his money. He's super happy. He kisses Jesus and all this. And then he goes before the Sanhedrin, and they condemn him. And, when, and it says, when Judas saw that Jesus was condemned, he was filled with remorse. And that's when he went back to the temple. He threw all the money into the temple and says, I betrayed innocent blood. It's like he, it wasn't until he was condemned that he was remorseful. So I, I sincerely think he thought Jesus was going to escape and he was going to make an easy 30 silver. And uh, as soon as he realized he wasn't, he did not want the silver anymore. Anyways, that's just my own little thought. But Satan enters him and he goes to the chief priest and wants to betray Jesus. It says they're delighted. I'm always still a little confused here, still. The story is interesting. Uh, and not so much in this gospel and one of the others... It, it seems to be written in such a way that's like, hey, you guys follow me. The one I kiss is the man. You arrest him. Like, they didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't recognize him or something. I, I, I don't know. It, it's something a little confusing about the way that it's wording here to me. Um, but anyways, I don't know why he needs to watch for a time to hand him over. Of course, now it, this one says to hand him over when there no crowd was present, which makes a lot more sense. Uh, this that little detail in this gospel is uh, is helpful because they wanted to be able to attack Jesus when nobody was there to back him up. Then came the day of unleavened bread. I, that, that struck me weird too. The day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. I don't know if they just called it the feast of unleavened bread back then, and they didn't call it Passover, and we just call it Passover now. There are places I think where it's called Passover in Scripture, or maybe it's not. Anyways, that's the day it was to be sacrificed. The Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. 
Jesus sent P uh, Peter and John saying, Go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. He says, Where do you want us to prepare for it? He says, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room and all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. That's just a fun statement. There's nothing, you know, there's no deep theology in it, but it's just exciting. I mean, I think we all want to live by sight a little bit. I mean, I think a lot of times that's kind of like where we like the end time stuff. We want to, we know what's supposed to happen. Then when we see it happen, we're like, we're rejuvenated with, see, I knew it. It's true. And I'm sure it was that way somewhat for them that they're like, okay, go to town. There's going to be a guy with water. Follow him to his house and say, we're coming to your house. I'm sure that was very weird, and they did it, and it came out just like they said. And uh, it just, again, shows the, well, I mean, omnipotence of, of Jesus, you know, Jesus knowing stuff, you know, here. I don't know if he had all of his omnipotence there as a man, but one way or the other, he knew that this guy was going to be there. He knew maybe the guy always was there. I don't know. Still, it's just an exciting thing. Imagine they go to town, and they see that guy, they follow him, and then they start making, they're like in somebody else's house preparing dinner. To a furnished room, ready to go. I mean, it makes me wonder if the Holy Spirit led this guy to prepare for everybody else, or maybe he had prepared this room for him and his guests, or uh, I don't know. It's just interesting to think about. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover. Oh, he called the Passover there. Passover with you before I suffer. And again, it's not clear even to the disciples here that he was going to suffer. But Jesus said some weird things sometimes. And so they were probably pretty confused. Don't forget, it's right about this time. I don't think it's in this gospel. Uh, but right about this time, Jesus tells them that they're going to kill me and put me to death. And Peter's like, no, they'll never do this to you. And, you know, he says, get behind me, Satan, saying it to Peter. Uh, because Peter couldn't fathom the fact that they were going to take him and kill him. And so that little line there about, I want to eat this before I suffer, they were like, okay, Jesus is going to suffer. And you see in lots of other places, I love that you don't ever get quite as much of the uh, the relationship. I mean, it's there if you ready to look for it, between Jesus and the disciples. Um, there's times where you're going to see the argument here again. They kind of threw it in this gospel, like, they, like Luke almost forgot to write about it. And I'll point that out when we get there. But he, it, about them arguing who's going to be the greatest. Uh, in one of the other Gospels, it says they were on the road walking, and they had argued about who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus was like, hey, what were you guys arguing about on the road? And all of them shut up. They were like, I'm not saying nothing, because Jesus is going to yell at me, <laughs> or make a fool out of me. And I just think that's just funny, because there's times where it says, are you still so dull? You know, he's, he's almost... I'm not going to say Jesus is insulting him, but he was very firm and very hard on his disciples. He wanted to teach them things and didn't want their own personalities to run away with them. And uh, I just think it's a neat to think about. Because again, we kind of get the idea of gentle Jesus, who's just, I, my children, I am here to show you divine happiness. And, and, that's, and this is the same Jesus who twisted a cord of three cords and went in there and whipped people out of the temple, flipped the tables, and uh, yelled at them, calling them, call them all kinds of names under the sun as far as, you know, their days of curses, you know, and uh, it's just, you don't always have the gentle Jesus idea. Remember the part where he's sleeping on the boat and there's a big storm and Jesus is asleep? And it's like there was a huge storm. They think they're about to drown. And they finally go wake up Jesus. Um, Jesus, um, we we're, we're might uh, drown. And you know, he says, hey, do you still have no faith? You know, And he's like yelling at them for being scared. And they didn't know what to do. I just, I don't know. I, I, I just love that little interaction. It's different than you would normally think of Jesus. And I think that that's fun. Because, you know, they say, well, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And, well, Jesus whipped them out. Of, <laughs> Jesus made a whip. <laughs> uh, but anyways, I just think that's interesting and fun to think about. It's okay to be firm with people sometimes. Okay, so anyways, for I tell you, I will not eat of it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. 
And taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So um, I think about this sometimes, and this is not something that I'm going to hold to. But he says, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. But they gave him wine vinegar when he was on the cross, and it said he drank it. Of course, one of the ones says he wouldn't drink it. The other one says he did drink it. Either way, I don't, this was like hours before that. So, um, But about eating again, I think it's about eating not bread, but the Passover. And it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. I don't necessarily think that that means... Um, Uh, actual physical food because what does he say right here he takes he takes the bread and he says this is my body given for you do it as remnants of me this is the cup of my blood uh, which is poured out for you and so another place he says unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no life in you and of course jesus is the passover lamb and so some people see this as a reference to communion um that they're going to keep doing this until uh the kingdom of god comes all these different things I, I'm a little confused on it myself. I'm not confused, but I'm I'm un, unsure to say exactly what he's meaning by it. Um, but whatever it is, um, this is the Last Supper. It was which was interesting because it was just regular supper, right? I mean, this of course was the Passover meal, but they got together and they broke bread all the time, right? It wasn't the last ceremony. It wasn't this time where they were all like, here's your thimble full of grape juice, and here's a tiny little speck of some crumbs for your for you to eat. It, this wasn't a ceremony. It was the last supper. It was their dinner. It was a Passover meal. In fact, it was probably a greater meal than they normally would have had. And it doesn't talk about eating the meat, but obviously it says when the lamb had to be sacrificed. And so the whole point was to eat the lamb. You don't have Passover without lamb. And so uh, this, was a, this was a feast. It was a big deal. It wasn't a, a, a ceremony. You know, I kind of think that the way we do communion traditionally today, it's this thing we do. We're not even hungry. We're just like swallowing some stuff, saying some words, and we go home as if that's what is meant by it. And I don't necessarily think that it is. I think the ultimate thing is to remember that he's the Passover lamb. He's our bread. His blood is our drink. And we were to remember that sacrifice that he did for us all the time. I think that's truly what communion does. And I think you can do that every time you eat food. Because that's the analogy here. It's not, I personally don't think it's there's something wrapped up in having to be wine or grape juice or the fruit of the vine or whatever. Um, or that it has to be bread or whatever. Um, Jesus is the bread of life, obviously. and it, But if they had eaten different food... On this scenario, then it would have been different food when he talked about it. You know what I mean? I think it's not necessarily talking about... I personally don't see this as... It's got to be bread, got to be grape, you know, juice. Can't be Kool-Aid, got to be real fruit of the vine. I, I don't I don't know that that's the point of what communion is about. I think it's about remembering what Jesus is about to do. How he's the Passover lamb. In his flesh is what gives us nourishment. Not because we're going to eat his flesh, but because his words are life. And he gives us life in him. And so by eating his flesh, it talks about it, um, it is understanding his teachings and trying to be like him and to strive after him and to learn from him. That's what it means to eat the bread. And, and the new covenant is blood. It's the same thing. Uh, the new covenant we have is not like the old covenant. Let's, let's be clear here. Let's read the verses here. Um, I've taken the... Don't you piss, miss it? Let's see. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, this is, Take this and divide it among you, for I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and said to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, the cup saying, this, is the, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. First communion was in Lutheran church with real wine. Always gave me heartburn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's actually some confusion about, there's actually a surprising lack of evidence about the first century. It's highly likely that what they called wine, it was just grape juice. It could have been grape juice. It could have been fermented wine. I don't think it was relevant. I think they probably had it either way. If they had to squeeze a bunch of grapes into a cup, they would have called that wine. That doesn't mean they didn't have fermented wine. They did. They didn't have no 100 proof stuff like we got today. 
um, but they still have uh, it was it could have been fermented or it might not have um, but this thing about the new covenant in yeah it was a good point Andromeda about new wine uh, the, the cup is a new covenant in my blood that's an important word because what is the old covenant everybody talks about the old covenant old covenant is the old testament well, you don't realize the old covenant specifically. What was in what was it called? The thing they carried around on their poles uh, between them, and they, it was inside of the temple. It was what the ark of the covenant. The ark just means a container, the container of the covenant. What was inside of the ark of the covenant? And Hebrews calls it the stone tablets of the covenant. The stone tablets, the Ten Commandments. Those are the old covenant. So then what does it mean? This says it's a new, this is cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out to for you. And again, we call the old covenant for a reason. I, my, one of my favorite verses, one of the ones I memorized in Greek, is Hebrews 8.13. I'm going to real quick. I don't know who's here. I'm sorry, guys. Who is it? It's already time for bedtime, so she can't play right now. The neighborhood girl here wants to play, but it's, it's almost 9 o'clock. Uh, okay, yeah, Hebrews 8.13. By calling this covenant new... Oh, this is a quote from Jeremiah. Uh, just again, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. That's in Jeremiah. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now again, what was so bad about the covenant? Nothing. They're the Ten Commandments. They're all good things. Nothing wrong with keeping the Ten Commandments. But that's not what we get our righteousness from. They did them, they, they obeyed the Ten Commandments back then because it was written down on stone. And remember, the Pharisees, they kept the law perfectly. But Jesus came and said, you missed it. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you even lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. And if you look in the Old Testament, you're not going to find anywhere that says you can't lust in a woman in your heart. So Jesus is telling them they're breaking the law, even though the law didn't say that. They literally had a specific number of steps that they could walk and not break the law in their mind. Jesus said, hey, you guys, um, Saul, you're supposed to be in bed. Sorry. Um, he says, thou shalt not murder, but I tell you, if you have hate for your brother, you've already become a murderer, basically. And so Jesus came to tell him that they were still breaking the law, even if they were keeping it. And... The reason why this has gotten rid of is because there was there was fault with the people. We couldn't keep the law. We're not nobody. Everybody sins. You can't keep it. And whenever they they broke the the Ten Commandments, whenever they broke one of the laws in the Old Testament, they had to sacrifice an animal for their sins in the temple. And now Jesus made that sacrifice for us. That's why there's a new covenant in His blood. This is the Passover meal. This is, he's the lamb that sacrificed for the sins of the world. And as a result, we can have righteousness before God. Okay. You guys, I'm live, okay? Saul, you need to go to bed. Thomas just got home from work, and so I know, but she's it's almost nine o'clock, so okay, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. In the same way, after okay, yeah, this is the new covenant in my blood, so anyways, the new covenant is in is black. I heard some people say that the greatest commandments it says, uh, you know, the old there's old covenant had the two commandments, and then Jesus is with Jesus, it's there's the two commandments, the greatest commandments, which is. Love your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind is love your neighbor as yourself. And I, I don't know if that's uh, you know, written in stone anywhere, obviously. Um, but I think that's a pretty good summation of what God wants us to do. And uh, 
Paul says that instead of written on tablets of stone, they're written on tablets of human hearts. And I believe that's the, if you ever heard the dry bones passages in the Old Testament about, um, I will take out your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And I believe that's what's meant by that. The heart of stone is a reference to the stone tablets of the covenant, the stone tables, and the heart of flesh is what our God's laws are now written on our hearts as opposed to written in the Ark of the Covenant. So, anyways, Hebrews says that the Old Covenant is obsolete and outdated, and that was, in, that was back in those days, and it was ready to disappear. It hadn't disappeared yet. I think there's a time when they had both covenants were kind of in play. Isn't that what happened in Acts? A lot of people hadn't even heard of who Jesus was. And they actually, at Pentecost, they were there for the feast, and they came to sacrifice because that's what the law said. They hadn't heard of no Jesus. And they weren't even from there. They were from other countries. And they come in and they hear about this Jesus. And they say, oh my, what do we do? And they, he tells them, repent and believe the Lord Jesus. And you can be saved. You and everybody with you and all these sorts of things. And, uh, and they hadn't heard of it yet. And of course, you can't be guilty of something you hadn't heard yet. Which is why it says the old covenant was ready. To, it was outdated and obsolete but it says it was ready to vanish. And that was, of course, written before what? Before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, when Titus literally came in and they burned the temple to the ground, including the Ark of the Covenant that was in it and all the priesthood stuff, all the robes, all the gold, all the things that God told them to make. All of those things burnt, were destroyed, and they melted into the cracks of the foundation stones, and the Romans actually came by and pried the stones up so they could get every last drop of gold out of there. And so that's how thoroughly it was gone. When Jesus said, like he said in Mark Luke 21, not one stone here will be left upon another. That's when the Old Covenant fully disappeared, was when you no longer could keep it anymore. You can no longer go sacrifice the temple because there was no temple. That's why it's important. Love your neighbor as yourself. This sums up the law and the prophets. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So anyways, this is the covenant, the new covenant in my blood. He breaks the bread and gives the drink. And they probably ate the lamb too. It's not in here. Uh, but it was the Passover after all. But the hand of him who was going to betray me is with mine on the table. So this part here is different in all the Gospels. Uh, in one place... It says that somebody here is going to betray me. Who is it, Lord? And in one place, it's very secretive. And Peter asked John, hey, ask him who it is. Because John's his favorite or whatever. And he says, it's the person I'm going to give this piece of bread to. And he said, give him the bread. And then Satan enters Judas. And this one says Satan entered Judas before. Um, and anyways, there's, some, there's some, some details here. And I, I haven't said it in a while. Um, but there are some differences in the Gospels. I dare Carol call them contradictions in the Gospels. And that's okay. They actually prove the Gospels rather than disprove them. People say, oh, are you saying that the Bible's incorrect or it has contradictions in it? No, I, I'm not saying that at all. God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. These are true accounts written bound by people to the best of their ability, and they did the best they could. Sure, it's inspired. God brought things to their memory. The Holy Spirit helped them remember what to write and told them the things that they should write. But it wasn't a word for word. Write this letter, write this letter, do a space, write that letter, you know, all these types of things. And so one person writes the story from their point of view. Another person writes a story from another point of view. I have a little log, running log and a note of mine of different people who were atheists and set out to disprove the Bible. And because of these little differences in the Gospels, they decided this must be a true story because that's what it would be if it was true. If it were fake, all the four accounts would line up exactly. And you can ask any uh, you can ask any police officer if they sit down and they're, they're asking people about what happened in a, in a traffic accident for one. Uh, every person is going to see it a little bit differently and remember even some events differently. And in fact, that proves the story is true most of the time. So it doesn't change anything major. Satan still entered Judas, whether it was before he sat down or after he gave him the bread, or uh, they, 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 all this stuff is true. It doesn't change any of the major facts of anything. And we have to be okay with that because uh, non-Christian uh, enemies of the gospel, uh, those who wish to prove the Bible wrong, one of their common things to say is, well, isn't there these contradictions here that point some of these out? And 
I'm going to say a lot of Christians have a really hard time with the contradiction, which is why I'm trying to soften you up to them. None of them change the truth of anything in the Bible. They're only small details. And, uh, and they'll say, well, isn't your God true? Isn't this God's word? Yep, and it's perfect, right? Yeah, so why can't he write his books right? What kind of God of yours doesn't know how to write, a, write, a, write an account down? And, uh, of course, this contains God's word. But it isn't all God's word. I mean, it's all God's word in a figurative sense. But there are places where Paul says, for instance, Paul writes about virgins at one place. And Paul says, about virgins, I have no word from the Lord, but I give you my opinion from one who is trustworthy. And he goes on to talk about virgins. And he said, what he, said, what he says is basically that God hasn't told me about this, but I'm going to give you my opinion and you can trust me. Because what Paul was writing is his mind was not specifically from God. That doesn't mean it's not true. I and mean, we can still call it God's word in that regard. So I think it's just important to, uh, to be realistic about the Bible and to be real with it and not set ourselves up for these people to come in here and say, oh, your God is, your, your, is bad because you know, there's these contradictions in here. In reality, they prove these things correct. So let me give you another example. If I've uh, you know, offended anybody, you know, I apologize. But I just wanna, I want us to worship God and not worship the Bible. Even as great as the Bible is, the Bible's not God. And you know what? God is perfect. And if there are some minor de de inconsistencies here, that's no mar on the character of God, right? So here's a, here's a verse I'm going to quote to you. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. That's a Bible verse. It's in Acts. And um, does that mean that the, the goddess Artemis or Diana is great and uh, should be praised? No, it's not. It, it was a true account of something that they chanted while they were trying to stone to kill Paul and find Paul. And so it's a true story, but those words are not the words of God, right? So uh, just keeping everything in a, in a perspective of understanding where everything is at and understanding that this is an account written down by men who sometimes were many years after the fact and this Paul or Luke wasn't even there and he, he asked other people and got his opinions on what things he thought they said. It could, is it possible that he got things a little bit differently? Then I think, so I think it's, that's fair. I think it's fair to question memory and details of the events. The one place that uh, it says James and John asked Jesus, let do whatever we ask you. And Jesus says, what do you want? And he says, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left. And the other gospel, it says that James and John's mother came and said, do whatever I want, whatever I ask you for these sons of mine. One of them sat on your left, one on your right. Now, is the point that it, it was it either him, the, the sons that asked Jesus, or was it the mom that asked Jesus for the sons? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. It's the same story. It's the same general events. The minor details that don't change the story very much are irrelevant. Does that make any sense at all? I hope that I'm making sense. You guys are quiet. Still 50 people here, though, so I must not have lost any, but I lost many people. All right, so the Son of Man will go just as has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. In uh, one of the other Gospels, it says, after this, woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It says, it would be better for him if he had not been born. It's like when the Son of God tells you it's better if you had never been born, that is the height of of a terrible situation to be in. It also kind of proves there's a hell because what was in store for Judas was worse than never being born, which some people that don't believe in hell, you know, that's what they say. That it's not being born is the same thing, just stopping to exist. Uh, where are we at? I think we'll do one more verse here. They, they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. And that's, this is that part where it says, also a dispute arose among them, and which of them can be the greatest? And he goes on to talk about that. And he stops talking about one who was uh, going to betray him. It's like he added it in here. Like, oops, I forgot about that story about one's going to be the greatest. I better write it in here. And so he wrote it in. Um, I've seen a couple places like that. Because obviously if you're writing parchment, and you have a giant... Parchment was expensive. It was that parchment is actually... A lot of times it was papyrus or it could have been leather or other uh, skin. And so in order to find one that was dry, just perfect, 
uh, would have been difficult and they start writing something down and if you start over again there's no spell check there's no backspace button so they had to start over again so there's a couple places you'll see things like that a couple places where paul is writing and he'll uh he almost appears to be like oh uh yeah i i he says at one point i'm thankful i didn't baptize any of you so you couldn't say you were baptized in my name then he says oh yeah i did baptize stephanus in the house of fortunatus beyond that i don't remember if i baptized anybody else and he, he just finished saying he didn't baptize anybody but he's like oh crud i was wrong and so he adds it back in there of course rather than start all over they didn't scratch things out back then so i don't know interesting well maybe we should call that quits right there i think we will i think we'll wrap things up we're going to continue on verse 24 it actually has quite a few verses a lot of this there's not a lot of deep theological meaning it's just stories so not a lot really to we can kind of zoom through some of this so again be thinking about where we want to go what book we want to do next um as we do our bible study Anybody else have any questions or anything that I can try to answer or uh, things that they learned or pointed out or something they made that they thought about maybe while we were talking? I'm always interested to see where other people's minds are at because we can learn more things from each other. Well, I appreciate all you guys. All right. Well, I guess we can go ahead and start wrapping things up unless someone has a question that pops up in there. I appreciate all you guys. Let's pray here real fast. Dear God, thank you so much for this time and for this message. I pray you'll watch over us. And for all those people out there who have had a difficult day, uh, moms that are struggling and uh, people that are having a difficult time, that you would bring them peace in their mind and watch over them and help them to see that clearly the path they can take and to not worry or fret about things. And, those here that may need healing, I pray you will heal them and take care of them. Help us uh, to go in our week and to make you proud. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. I appreciate you guys. Don't forget to like the video on your way out. We will see you later.